we got it, the little slab cottage in the middle, which we call Barragaran Cottage, uh, because it's in um, memory of Barragaran. It's a social history of, of local communities, this particular building. So we'll have a look around these buildings later on. But I just wanted to, to share with you a little bit about why we're doing what we're doing and, and how far we've come since we started. Because when we started, there was nobody doing local history at all. And now look at all these books and all these people that are actually writing with the histories of places, which is wonderful. So I'll let you now do it in, um, in phases, if you like, just as small things. Like from Picton to Pretoria was our first major exhibition, and we produced a book about that as we went on. These will probably get revisited as people become more proficient at what they're doing. And the next one was the story of the mines. And as you come into the main building, there's a, the story of the mines is a, is a separate little exhibition. And um, there's, a, there's a, a button on the wall. If you press the button, it all lights up and you can see a 1930s mine. So don't forget to push the button. And that exhibition is called Mines and Men. And the men themselves actually wrote that exhibition. Colin Sproul um, did an oral history on them, and their, their stories are in here. When we first started that exhibition in 1990, there were 15 mines operating in Wallandilly, and there are only three left now. So as we're recording history, it's going as fast as we can catch it. We've done the, uh, all the orchards, and we'll have to revisit those as well. But then one of the main things that we actually have in our collection are the Urandri Baragarang scrolls. And they're very difficult to describe. Is that a phone call? Okay. <laughs> 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 that was playing me too. Um, in, in, about 15 years ago, a man called Ron Mills decided that he was going to write his family history. And as you probably know, when you start doing family history, it can take over your life. Yeah. And it did his. <laughs> and he started to record his mother's history. And he came, she, she was born in Urandari which is the village on the other side of Barragarang Valley that was a silver town. And he became so fascinated with this story that he, he decided to record everything that he could find. And he, instead of writing it down in notebooks or doing it on a computer, um, he traced it. So every letter, every document, every photograph that he found, he traced them onto huge long rolls of draftsman's tracing paper in uh, black ink. Unfortunately, they're fairly stable. So that was our bicentennial project. No, no, sorry, our federation project. And we actually got some money for that and um, bought her a, a lamp to read them because they're very small, the writing is very small. And um, she spent 18 months doing this. She worked from 6 o'clock in the morning to 3 o'clock in the afternoon and she's created 18,000 index cards. <laughs> Which is a lovely mixed blessing because they're, an, they're handwritten, so they've now got to be put onto the computer. So anybody's got nothing to do and want to come and do this job. <laughs> it's a very worthwhile job, but uh, it's a huge, huge job while all this was going on. So he wrote some of these stories down because um, while uh, she was doing all this, he was looking for some of the more interesting and unusual little bits and pieces that they, that they found in the scrolls. And um, in 1957, Claude Lee wrote a book called A Place to Remember. And um, he was interested in, in the valley as well. And he was interested in some of the uh, folk tales from the valley, of which there are thousands and thousands. And he wrote this book, this poem called The Decoy. And they were camped one night in Borogarang, and they were visited by some local boys who yarned with us around the fire. And the, and the talk turned to bird life. There were a lot of lyre birds in the valley, pigeons and bellbirds. And one boy told a hunting anecdote, which he called the decoy. To the old farm in the valley where I wandered as a boy, a hawker one day came and sold me a pretty toy. It was a whistle and a beauty, quite the best I've ever heard, to imitate the cries and calls of every kind of bird. We had a timbered hill nearby, I used to call it mine, with lovely scrubby gullies where the wongas used to dine, a scratching up the seeds that fell from wattle and pine. A lovely ferny gully there was just the very spot for me to try my whistle. Oh, a pigeon for the pot. So after work one afternoon, before the sun had set, I made up up the mountainside to see what I could get. When I got into the thick stuff, I commenced to ooh, 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 and an answer came directly, and I thought, this thing I'll do. I kept on ooh, 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 getting nearer 
creeping closer to the core, not hard to get a wonga now, no trouble this at all. I was getting set for shooting in some tall protecting fern, when suddenly I get a charge of third shot in my stern. <laughs> I couldn't make it out until I saw my brother Bill, his shotgun, still a smoking, come running down the hill. God almighty, Jack old man, he said, can this be you? It was no bloody decoy when I answered, ooh, 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 I didn't know you, Blighty, you bought a whistle too. <laughs> <laughs> that's, one the, that's one of the fun things about working in a, in a local museum, there's all the stories that you get. And we, we try and, we try desperately to get them out. There's another one here that's got lots of stories about the women. There's some amazing stories in this one. And this one starts off with Mary Wilde's letters to her mother in Wales. Mary Wilde was the first white woman to live in the, in, in the Oaks. Her husband was John Wilde, and he was given the job of taming all the, the, the wild cattle that were found in this area. You probably know the story of the wild cattle, how they escaped from the Sydney Cove and they came out, followed the Lapeen and Hawkesbury River into this area. And his job was to tame those cattle. And so, um, after the strength of that, he was given the job, uh, he was given the farm at the Oaks, which he called Vanderville. And that was the first name for the Oaks, it was the private village of Vanderville, in the English way, but it was always called the Oaks, which is the old name for it. But she talks about, when she's writing to her mother, she talks about how lovely it was coming into the harbour. It would have been impossible to describe the beauty and the grandeur of the scene we witnessed when we came within sight of Port Jackson. It appeared like a fairyland, such a prospect I never beheld. It is summertime, the people are busy harvesting and getting in their corn. Everything is a flourishing state and the crop is abundant. This must surely be the garden of the world. That was 1817. If she'd come the year before, there was no river. It had dried up. Everybody was desperate for rain. So it all depends on when he came, doesn't it? And the other stories in here was um, the story of the Aboriginal mid mid midwife in the area. And the valley, she brought all the babies into the world because she knew all the stories of her grandmother's bush tucker and bush medicines. And so we met a lot of her, her descendants when we researched their stories. A lot of our Aboriginal um, knowledge comes from this book here, My Recollections, which was published in the Oaks in 1914 and, uh, by the local newspaper. He, he took the trouble to record this old man's... Um, Memories before he died. He died in Camden Hospital the same year. And he was born in 1830 on the banks of Werribee Creek. His mother was called Wanduk, and she was the uh, daughter of the chief of the Gamingara people of the, of, of the Barabaran Valley. And um, his father was white, his mother was black, and he was growing up at the same time as the area was being changed. And that's why the exhibition that we've got down there is called Parallel Paths. There's two stories running side by side, two parallel stories. But it's given us a good idea of what it was like in the Oaks at that time. Of the, as that, at that time, and um, when we when we we actually asked the Mitchell Library if we could copy this book, and then we had um, a researcher research Billy Russell's story, and uh, Jim Smith has done the story of that, the life of Billy Russell, and in the back of the book he's put maps as to where he, he where this family where these people roamed, and they went from Bathurst through the Oaks out to. Um, uh, nearly, nearly to Kuma, really out, out west, the huge areas that, that, that they wandered in. And it just makes you think, oh, you know, it could have been me. So that's just, uh, and, and the, the other, new, the other new one is uh, Val Luigi's book on the story of um, the first explorer in, the, uh, in this area, which was Baralier, and he was a French explorer, and he was the first person to actually contact the people in the valley. And she's written this little this this book on explorations, and we also have a local a local author which write, who writes novels in the area. Charles Inglis. I don't know if you read any of his books. We've got some of those in the shop. And this is actually about a little country town. This is not the Oaks, but I don't believe in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and somebody was uh, wanting to know about bushwalking in the area. There's, uh, there's quite a few uh, Robert Slotter's books, which are very detailed if you want to go bushwalking in this area, and they're they're in the shops. There's a lot of his books by Liz Vincent on the Picton district. Uh, the only one we've read on Warragamba Dam is if anybody, anybody's got nothing to do, we want somebody to research the stories of the people who this. I don't know why, but it just makes you push it right on and then you turn and, it away. Uh, from and that's you. all I do. Ready, everybody? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Wow. Yeah. No. I've been using that one for about three years now. Mm. Now I lift it up. <laughs> <laughs> Like, would you like that instead? <laughs> <laughs> this is great for Halloween. Yeah. You know, Could I see the apple, please? Would you lift it up? Just slide it off, slide it off, because remember that it's on the right. And then hold it in your hand, otherwise you can pass. All the way, all the way. Oh. 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 Sorry about that. I'm not just kidding. I'm going to have to put it in the oven. Very good. You're going to have to start it. You can use it. What did they use the apple for? Right, well that's that's the next question. Anybody want to say? So what if we actually made <laughs> <laughs> this is this is your no just just to cut it along the rows. Okay. That's right. So what what did we make then? By doing that. A spiral. Tim, yeah. Tim, please do it. She knew it because in 1925, of course, there was no refrigeration. Oh, so so yeah. dried apples were, were a very valuable commodity. And she would put them, she would dry them by dipping them in lemon juice or something similar and drying them on the roof of the sheds oh. on, on brown paper. That's how she did it. And then she would put them away into little brown paper bags and keep them in the dark cupboard until Christmas. Because everybody wants dried apples to see Christmas to make sure they can She was our first entrepreneur, wasn't she? Yeah. <laughs> until the Aboriginal people explain what it was all about. And this is what we tell the children. Um, this is how they can communicate. This is a Kulaman, yeah? And it's from Queensland. We don't use this type of communication here. But it's the story of three rivers, which could have been the valley. And it's what the mother would have given to the daughter. And it's actually a map. And it's a map to tell, the daughter, to, to tell her how to find Bush Tucker. And as she's coming into the valley, she walks the white dots of a day's walk. The black commas are where animals are lying down to shake their leg. The yellow dots are bush tucker. So she can walk for one, two, three, four, five, six days, and then she comes to a place where there's lots of bush tucker and there's animals lying down, so there's plenty of places to eat. And there's, of course, there's water from the river. But you'll see the white dots go also around the animals. You count them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Then she has to move on. Yes, to walk one, two, three, four, to the next bit where there's lots of things. And of course, that's a, a conservation thing, so that they didn't always eat out the country before they came on. And if you look at that point of view, it's just the most amazing story. And if you look at all, in every Aboriginal thing that you see has got this, this secret code, if you like, which is really well worth asking the Aboriginal people themselves to explain to you. Sometimes they'll tell you if it's not a secret thing, but uh, this is just a, a, a survival thing. But, this is what we tell the children, you see, and then they do their own little message sticks like this, and they tell their own story with dots and things, and it's good. Yeah. You know which is east and west? When? when you <coughs> I've got no idea. You have to ask an Aboriginal person. <laughs> 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 one of the questions I didn't ask, ask them, yeah, every October, and this is the story of the first warrior, Gawain, and the story of, of how the White Waratah started. It's a nice story. I won't read it to you. It's much easier than it really is. Right, before we go out into that wind, before we go out into that wind, I'll just show you the, the story of the, of the flooding of the Warragamba Dam, seeing the branch <coughs> down and all the rest of it. It's quite interesting to see how all this started. If I can remember how to use it. And so, a mile upstream from the old weir, a site is chosen on which the wall will rise 400 feet to the top of the gorge. This, in turn, will cause the water to rise in the valley with its steep sides forming a natural storage area. Right of the new dam, giant drills bite deep to find the solid foundation for the wall of concrete that will rise here. Water will be diverted around the works through tunnels, which ensure that the city's supply is maintained. Along the gorge and back into Balagarang, workmen set about the task of clearing off all trees and vegetation. 16,000 acres of magnificent landscape go before axe and bulldozers. Man 
man and machine change the face of the land in the interest of progress. Behind the temporary copper dam, the mighty project slowly begins to take shape, as from the bed of the river rises what will be the highest dam in the southern hemisphere, with a water capacity four and a half times that of Sydney Harbour. Huge quantities of concrete are poured into the giant tapering wall 350 feet thick at the base. They go in search of a new valley in which to start again, knowing that soon the doomed valley they leave behind will be transformed into a vast inland lake a lake from which will flow added prosperity for the nation.